Number one, Mr. LaForge Engage. Space, the final frontier. Been working on that one for a while. You are live with the App Show. Mike Agarbo here in studio. I've got uh, fellow app nerds John Beeler and Graham Williams with me today. Today on the program, we are going to be talking uh, about a few different things. McDonald's. You want to apply for a job there? You can do that with Alexa and Google Assistant. Uh, and also the upcoming uh, augmented reality revolution. This is uh, things like glasses with heads up displays. Uh, what's going to be happening there? What are we seeing right now? And how soon will it be coming? And we also have our uh, Hot 5 app countdown. This week, it's the Hot 5 self-help apps or? <laughs> apps to help you learn. That's right. <laughs> hot, hot 5 apps to, to help learn you, learn, learn you a new skill. Learn, learn you, you a new skill. In this case, Like, like grammar and talking. <laughs> yes. Let's talk about some of the app news uh, this week. And this was an interesting one. Uh, there is a alternative app store for iPhone users called the Alt Store. Explain. Does it have a red hat? <laughs> it probably does. <laughs> um, so basically what this is, is, is uh, a developer sort of found a workaround to create an app store that you can install uh, other apps that aren't approved by Apple on your iPhone device without having to jailbreak it, which is kind of a big deal. Because up until now, if you wanted to do any of this type of stuff, like say, for example, install an emulator for an old video game console, for example. Yeah. Uh, Apple doesn't allow those types of things on the App Store, so you'd have to use a jailbreak, uh, jailbreaking method to get into your phone and then basically sideload it like you would on an Android device uh, to put these apps there. And this developer has found a kind of a clever way of getting around that by essentially installing a small app on your desktop or laptop computer that will be doing the, the Wi-Fi sync to your iPhone and sort of injecting itself in that pathway to put apps onto your phone. This sounds dangerous. It does. Well, it, and it kind of is. I mean, it's a little ironic because we were just talking about the new Huawei store last week, right? And I brought up that, well, you know, we've seen jailbreaks in the last little while, but there hasn't really been a lot of reason to jailbreak your devices. Well, Most Huawei needs one now. <laughs> Yes. Most of, most of the, the features that people have put into jailbreaks, Apple has put into iOS. One of the big ones, though, you did mention it, are things like emulators, pieces of software that are of dubious copyright status. I mean, emulators, uh, Nintendo gets a little bit in a snit about because they're usually used to pirate their uh, content. So the idea that this thing comes out a week later, I find is it's timely. Yes. Which is kind of interesting. Um, so the, the, the key to this thing, because this is used by schools, it's used by businesses, the actual framework underneath yeah. uh, for people who are developing their own in-house apps, right? So if we were to develop an in-house app store, or app show app, where we we're going to organize all of our stories, we could not push that out to our devices. Now, typically, these DIY apps have to be refreshed every seven days. You've got to go in, you've got to manually sync it back to your device. Right, kind of, it's a pain in, the, pain in the neck way of keeping people from essentially doing what's happening right now. And to John's point, this app now sees that seven day time limit. And before it comes up, it resyncs all of your credentials and apps back to your phone, basically refreshing all of them in real time, giving you sort of the convenience of the always on app there. It's kind of ingenious. Like it's a, it's a crafty workaround. Can Apple kill it? They could. Right. Um, it yeah. won't be easy, though, because those aforementioned groups, all those schools out there, you know, you got tons of grade schools and high schools for whom coding is the big thing. And they've got kids working on these things. Making that process more difficult, I think, is going to be something that Apple doesn't want to do. It's already kind of cumbersome in that seven day refresh process, because, you know, these coding classes take more than seven days, typically. So it makes sense that, you know, if anything, be nicer if it was a longer period of time um but yeah I, I think graham's right i think shutting this down uh, at least is not a simple process because it would actually shut off a lot of other people's access to this mechanism and i think the question here is is apple going to look at the alt store lovely name are they <laughs> going to look at this and say you're enough of a threat to our business, which would be the first and foremost thing. You're not enough of a threat to the security of our users, which I think would be I think they're more important. concerned about the security. And well, the third one is, are you enough of a threat to the business that our app developers create? 
Now, the one thing that will probably get this thing shut down if they sh if they do have to shut it down is people pirating legitimate applications, which they're going to. Yes. They're probably going to try. Yeah. You know, well, the other thing too, though, is, we, and we've seen this before, um, Nintendo would be very interested in shutting this down because it's the primary use case for it. Um, and we've seen other companies go after the gatekeepers of these systems and stores, regardless of whether or not they were complicit in the, you know, uh, marketing of it or the, the hosting of those things. Uh, we saw that with um, the recent uh, Super Channel lawsuits uh, against all of the retail stores that sold Android boxes that had the potential to put on streaming music and movie channels on those boxes. So the, the, the copyright holder is going to be very interested in shutting the service down, regardless of who's hosting it or who's running it and, and how Apple's involved, because Apple would also be uh, an accomplice in this process. Now, the cat's kind of out of the bag on this one, though, right? Because yeah. this is an open source project, which means, which means it's available on GitHub. Now, that as a developer, you know, I think a lot of people are looking at it going, that's the right thing to do. Uh, but it does mean that if Apple does shut down the alt store, it's a little like a Hydra, right? cut the head off to pop up in its place. Well, in this case, there are unlimited copies of this software already out there. So if Apple does want to stamp, stamp it out, they do have to go back to that process that they're looking at with being able to distribute apps and kind of shut that down some way. Well, I like what they do on Android. You have the option, as long as you're the administrator of that device, you can say, allow unknown sources. And you can bring in other app stores and other apps uh, because you've given it permission to have the keys to your device's kingdom. And so it's it's on the user then to decide what they want to do, what apps are going to let in. I mean, there's no question there's some pretty malicious apps out there in these alternate stores on the Android side. Um, but it, it's something that Apple hasn't really had or made very made it very easy to do. And it, I think it's nice, it would be a nice option for people to make their own decisions about that. See, this is one of the things I like about the App Store ecosystem because, and you know, I'm going to earn a lot of ire and a lot of hatred from people out there when I say, you know, I'm sure you are very, very diligent with your device and you'd be very good with your software. But for every one of you out there who's absolutely brilliant, there are 10 idiots. And those idiots, unfortunately, respect to you out there, idiots, uh, but you are installing things that can... That's, that's Graham Williams talking, by the way. <laughs> Please direct your hate mail to me. Uh, but these are people who are, you know... Uh, they're downloading software that does compromise these devices. Yes. But more than that, we've actually seen this. These devices can be used as zombies yes. in uh, denial of service attacks. They can go after uh, your your contacts, right? They be, they can spread into your contact book because they're sending you this malware stuff directly. Here, open this file. And if you've got, you know, untrusted on, but you get it from a trusted source, this is basically the Windows PC environment you know, since the, the dawn of the Windows PC environment. It's the Mac PC environment to a certain degree, right? Gatekeeper does a fairly decent job of keeping a lot of that stuff out. So looking at this, I look at it and go, the alt store, you know, from a freedom of information standpoint, from a freedom of doing what you want with your device is awesome. Um, would I touch it with a 10 foot barge pole? Hell no. John's going to, I have no doubt of that in my mind. Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> on your phone. <laughs> I'm on, on my phone. Uh, you brought up another story that we're following as well, John. Uh, Super Channel, one of the cable movie channels uh, here in Canada. It's been around since I was young. I remember that was the channel to get to get all the cool movies and stuff. Watch uh, it eight times in three days. Exactly. <laughs> uh, you know, and I'm sorry. I didn't even realize it was still going. Yeah. But some, it is. There's a Super Channel executive who's just like, <sighs> oh, Mike Agarbo, damn you. Um <laughs> But they are having a challenge, obviously, like TV numbers are dwindling, yeah. right? Because more people are cutting the cords. And obviously a big reason is because everyone's getting streamed mm -hmm. content. And another reason that Super Channel says is people are pirating the content as well. I think that's diminishing as there's more uh, choice as far as streaming, like pay streaming channels uh, to, to get. Uh, so they're going after some retailers here in Canada. You've probably seen the story, going after Best Buy, London Drugs, Staples. I forget the fourth one. Uh, basically saying that their staff, their retail staff, have been encouraging the pirating of movies and also the retailers by selling these 
Android TV boxes. And so these are boxes you can hook up to your TV. They run Android, so you can download the hundreds of thousands of Android apps that are out there. And some of them, uh, like Kodi, for example, K-O-D-I, is an app that you can download to stream not only your own content, but also, you know, with some tweaks, download pirated movies and TV shows as well. So they're saying that the retailers not only by selling these and their staff encouraging customers to buy them because they can get free content uh, is hurting their business and they're suing them. Which just seems so crazy because there's a million other ways and devices to get that pirated content. Now, in their defense, they have over 160 videotaped examples of this happening in stores across Canada. Now, uh, I'm not saying they're wrong. No. Fun little fact about me. I used to work at Future Shop many, many years ago. And uh, the idea that a salesperson would tell you how to pirate something is absolutely true. Yes. Right? Like, I I, I witnessed this firsthand. We, We had people explaining in detail how to download and use BitTorrent. Yeah. Right. They had a they had a handout for crying out loud. This happens. <laughs> now, the question is, uh, should these retailers be held accountable for actions that people on their floors are taking? That's a good question. You know, if there has not been a mandate from their head office that says, don't tell people to pirate, perhaps that would be the first place to start. Well, I'm, I'm betting that memo's gone out now. A- absolutely. Yeah. Um, is but- it being listened to? No, no. The no. the guy making fifteen bucks an hour doesn't really care. He wants to make the customer happy. Yes, right. And that customer is going to buy the cables and the extended warranty, all that sort of stuff. That's that's really the end goal here. Um, like, is piracy honestly that big of an issue? Piracy is a customer service issue. It's a pricing issue. Yeah, but right? I, I think it's gone down dramatically. I I think we've seen with uh, music is a great example. Yes, so many people downloaded stuff from Napster. It that hastened the demise of physical media like CDs and cassette tapes, right? But the music industry has sprung back because there's lots of music subscription services now for nine to $15 a month, depending how many people in your family, you get millions of songs. And it's like the best thing ever. And the music industry is making money again. So what you're saying here is that if you make the content available to your audience and you make the price palatable, they're actually going to go ahead and do this rather than steal it. I think Super Channel's big challenge right now is that they are a middleman, and if they do not spend more money on creating original content so that they're a place that people want to go to find this original content and pay for it, they are going to be dead in five to 10 years because if you look at every other uh, producer out there right now, all the studios, uh, all the channels like CBS, they're coming out with their own streaming service for a monthly subscription charge for original programming. And so there's not going to be a lot of middlemen left if they're all doing this. Bang on. Okay. Uh, we covered a lot there. Uh, (laughs) when we come back from the break, we still have a lot more to talk about on the app show today. How would you like to apply for a job at McDonald's with Alexa or your Google Assistant? Well, we're going to be talking with the folks at McDonald's on how they're doing that and if it's working. And we will uh, also be chatting about augmented reality. Is it here? What's happening? How soon are we going to get these cool glasses with heads-up displays? You're listening to the App Show here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this. You are back with the App Show. Let's talk about uh, Alexa being used for... Uh, Kind of a, a cool uh, application. We've uh, got uh, Stephanie Hardman on the line. She's the Chief People Officer for McDonald's Canada. Thanks for joining us, Stephanie. Thanks, Don. Great to be here. Uh, so when I think of uh, Alexa, I think most people use it to ask uh, Alexa the weather or to play some type of music, but you can also apply for a job at McDonald's now. How does that work? Absolutely. She's one of our new recruiters. Uh, it's as simple as asking Alexa, Alexa, help me get a job at McDonald's. Uh, and she will walk you through a few prompts. You provide your name, your phone number, and a location in which you want to work. You decide whether you want to be a crew member or a manager. And she'll provide you with a list of available roles in that city that match that description. That's that's very cool. So, uh, for, cool. yeah, for people to use this on their Alexa device, do they have to enable that mm-hmm. skill? No, the skill's already there. Um, They can run it on their app. They can run it on their smart speakers. Uh, Alexa is fully fully trained and ready to go. And this works on Google as well, isn't that right? It does. Um, um, We're having a bit of difficulty, I'll be honest, as with any new technology. 
the skill isn't working quite the way we had hoped to on Google. So we're working very closely with the team at Google to get that resolved. But it should be as simple as, okay, Google, help me get a job at McDonald's. So why did you go down this road? Well, uh, not unlike what we're doing in our restaurants, we're innovating and uh, really trying to uh, to look for employees uh, where and, and when they're at. And so I have a 19-year-old, uh, and I interact more with her on my smartphone than I do in person. <laughs> and so uh, when you look at 70% of our crew being, uh, being youth, uh, then that's probably the way we need to be hunting for them. And so... Uh, for us, it's really about ensuring that if they're thinking about getting a job, it's as easy as talking to Alexa. And what is what is the command again? Alexa, help me get a job at McDonald's. We just set off everyone's uh, Amazon Echo device <laughs> right now. Uh, how long has this uh, been uh, working? Actually, we went live yesterday. It's a oh. global uh, global activation, and it's live yesterday. Oh, so it's not just uh, not just in Canada. No, we've gone live in nine countries. Uh, for the world's first, so this is a this is a big deal for McDonald's. Uh, how, what other ways do you guys uh, use to to recruit people? I mean, this is uh, obviously a very new high tech uh, way, but uh, are other ways that uh, work for attracting, uh, I guess, the the younger crowd? Yeah, well, we tried something new, and and I think what you'll see with us is continued continued innovation in the way that we try to reach out to potential potential applicants. This, earlier this year. Uh, we ran a campaign called Snapplications, and so you could apply for a job uh, through Snapchat. Uh, we, we were very, very pleased with, uh, with the number of applicants we got, on, again, on a single day. Uh, really overwhelmed some of our restaurants with the number of people who wanted to work with us. And so, uh, so it's a great news story. It just proves that we're trying new things uh, and that, that, that the kids are doing, and it's working. Seriously, you used Snapchat and it worked? Yeah, it did. <laughs> that, is, that is very cool. That is very cool. <laughs> I, I also wonder, though, how many people were just sort of doing it for kicks, though? Like, what's the vetting process well, with a Snap application? Sure. Well, the Snapchat, uh, you were able to upload a little video telling us why you wanted to get a job with us at McDonald's. And um, oh. the, the recruiters at the restaurant were reviewing it. And I would say we, we did, we, what we heard was the quality of the applicants was higher than we generally see. And so there were a lot of hires made through Snapchat. Did they have the lip sync in that video? <laughs> <laughs> well, they got to, they got to, uh, there was a lens, so they got to wear uh, the McDonald's uniform oh. with a customized name tag. <laughs> really? That, <laughs> that, that is, fun. Yeah. that is yeah. really cool. It was a lot of fun. We're talking with Stephanie Hardman. Uh, she's the chief people officer over uh, at McDonald's Canada. They're using uh, Amazon Alexa. Now you can uh, apply for a job at McDonald's uh, with uh, a simple uh, voice command. I want to thank you for joining us uh, today, Stephanie. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. We come back from the break. More apps to talk about here on the App Show. Stay tuned. You are back with the App Show. Mike Agarbo here with fellow app nerds Graham Williams and John Beeler. Uh, a little later, we'll be talking about augmented reality. Are we being trained for the next evolution in mobile technology? Well, Graham seems to think so, and we'll tell you why. Uh, you know what time it is? The Weekly App Hot Five. This week, our Hot 5 app countdown, John, is all about learning a new skill. I think we could all learn some new skills, a particular set of skills. <laughs> uh, let's start off with uh, number five. We have Masterclass. Uh, this is available for iOS and also on uh, web browsers. $180 yearly membership. Uh, with this, you've probably seen advertisements for this uh, on your Facebook account. They've got them all over the place, how to be a director with Ron Howard, and I forget the cooking ones. Gordon, Gordon Ramsay. Ramsay. Gordon Ramsay. You can uh, be a, a musician like uh, Dead Mouse. Dead Mouse. Yeah. Love it. So you can learn skills from the best of the best. Like you said, cook like Gordon Ramsay. Learn the ropes of directing movies from Ron Howard. Masterclass offers classes taught by the experts themselves right on your iPhone or on your web browser. Number four, we've got uh, Linda. Yeah. Lynda.com. So Lynda is an iOS app, it's an Android app, and it's available through a web portal. Uh, it's $25 a month, which seems pricey, but uh, certain local public libraries, not the least of which being the Vancouver Public Library, if you have a library card, you get free access to Lynda. This is kind of brilliant. How much is a library card? They're free. So why wouldn't you go get a library card? I don't know. I just did. We just told them how to do that. <laughs> but how can the library afford this? 
it's, it's part of a partnership with Linda, right? Gets people enthusiastic about it. You bring it back to your office. You say, guys, we should have a Linda membership. Suddenly now it's propagating all of this good stuff. <laughs> yeah. I got it free at the Vancouver Public Library. <laughs> Everyone go down there and get it free. I, I have to imagine that the VPL is probably paying for access to Linda, but they think that it is a benefit to their users, which I have to agree. You know, uh, Vancouver Public Library, I just got a library card. Absolutely fantastic down there. They actually have podcast recording studios, which I think is really, really I've neat. recorded one there. Have you? I have. Are they good? Yeah, it's really nice. It's very, it's a professional studio. Yeah. As professional as us. <laughs> Getting there. Getting there. So um, this is one of the original online resources for learning new skills. They have courses in everything from coding to search engine optimization to photo editing and graphic design. So this is a go-to for countless learners out there. Yours, yours truly included. Um, they offer video courses, traditional learning courses, and they cover a wide range of fields. And of course, the one membership, which again, if you've got a VPL membership, uh, covers everything. John, we're gonna get you to cover number three, Skillshare. Yes, this is for iOS and Android. It has a free trial or $45 a year. Uh, Skillshare is another great resource for a wide range of courses. Go from no skill to expert with this app's well-crafted courses. Skillshare has some free courses that you can enjoy with a free trial or go for the premium account and get access to all of the courses. Very cool. We're talking about the uh, top five apps for learning new skills. Number two is Udemy. Uh, this is for iOS and Android. And what's interesting about this is if you don't like commitment, Udemy is probably good for you. The app offers on-demand courses you can purchase starting at just $10.99 that's $11, rather than requiring a membership. Like Linda and Skillshare, the courses cover a wide range of topics from uh, coping to creative disciplines to yoga, everything. Like it's a that. great service, I've used it myself. Do you like it? Yeah, yeah. The one thing I do have to say is you have to wait for a sale, right? Because a lot yes. of those courses are $39, $350, and then they go off on sale for like 90% off at 11 bucks. So if you're paying more than $11, uh, wait just for, wait. wait for a sale. Okay, number one. In the Hot 5 App Countdown this week, uh, these are apps that can help you learn new skills. Uh, John, Coursera. Coursera. This is for iOS and the web, starting at about $100 a course. Okay. Uh, Coursera actually offers certifications and degrees to further your skills and career. You can even earn degrees from prestigious institutions like Yale and Stanford and from tech giants like IBM. Very cool. That was your Hot 5 App Countdown this week. When we come back from the break, we've got more to talk about. We're going to be talking about augmented reality, and this is uh, kind of the next generation of tech that we will be using. Right now, we've got iPhones and Android smartphones in our faces. That will be changing. Uh, the, the technology will be built into our glasses and our contact lenses, and uh, some people are saying, like Graham Williams here from the App Show, that we're already being trained on how to use them and you wouldn't even know where. You're listening to The App Show here on the Chorus Radio Network, back after this. You are back with The App Show. Before we talk about uh, the latest in augmented reality and all that future stuff, uh, let's get our iPhone tip of the week. iPhone tip of the week. Unleash the power of your iOS device. All right, so our iPhone tip of the week, actually, you know, one of my favorite songs, Blinded by the Light. Yes. Yep. Yep. She, she blinded me with science. Uh, since the uh, invention of... That's, dark mode. Those are two different two different songs. songs. Yeah, okay, right up there. Um, but since the invention of dark mode on uh, Android, I've been lusting for a dark mode on iOS. Now with iOS 13, it's here. The problem is though that there are still a ton of apps out there. Facebook, I'm looking directly at you with sunglasses on. But I'm also looking at Apple. Okay, so I I like the idea of dark mode, but it's not consistent through all of Apple stuff either. Like Safari, no. it is in bookmarks. It is. But then when I bring up web pages, it's not. Well, because it's the interface. Am, I, it's am the, I doing something wrong? It's the web page there that is actually not set for a dark mode. It's overriding the dark mode settings by having its own style okay, sheet. Got now, it. Certain websites actually, like Ars Technica, for example, have a dark mode that can interact with your device. And so if it knows it's past a certain time, it puts it into a dark theme. That's kind of cool, right? Yeah. So here's the thing. Uh, if you did have an app that was being rebellious and is not on the dark mode train just yet, you can actually put it into a dark-like mode with something called Smart Invert. 
Okay. So this is actually an assistive feature. Uh, it's under accessibility options and it inverts the colors of your screen. Now, in the past when we've had invert modes, it's basically like a negative of what you used to see. Very, very hard to interact with and read. So Smart Invert actually does this, but gives you a better set of colors. It's actually quite a bit more readable uh, and it's actually a little easier on your eyes. So to get to this mode, you go to Settings, Accessibility, Display and Text Size, scroll down and you can turn on Smart Invert. I've got one more feature for you here as well. Okay. This is kind of neat, which is if you go to your accessibility features, you can actually put in an accessibility shortcut. So you can use a gesture to turn on or off an accessibility feature like Smart Invert. Okay. So what you can do explain like a triple tap on the down volume button, which is when you triple tapped your iPhone button in the past, it would go into invert mode. Exactly, right? Yeah. So you can set it to do that. And you can actually set the gesture that will do this. And that will give you the ability to turn on or off Smart Invert. You have to say John, John is trying it right now. It's not, <laughs> it's not working on his iPhone 11. Uh, no, that's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Have you guys been using dark mode? I guess you kind of have. It just kind of automatically started working on my that iPhone. That was one of the main reasons I installed the beta. Yeah. It was to get dark mode. Messages past 11 o'clock no longer basically light up my house anymore. It's great. Yeah, I'm still not used to it. No? Are, no. no do you have it it's on pretty or dark. off or are you doing it's the... It's pretty dark. <laughs> I know that's the purpose of dark mode. It's, like the it's, just, it's just different and weird. That's yeah. all. Well, it takes some getting used to, but I mean, I've been using Apollo, uh, which is a Reddit client developed by a Canadian. If you haven't downloaded Apollo, by the way, try that out. Uh, but it has a seamless dark mode, which again, when the sun sets, it goes into dark mode. It's fantastic. I, I wonder if the dark mode color scheme palette may be, may be harder for you to read because you are colorblind. Interesting. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I don't mind it lighting up at night because then I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> Am I wrong? You're just old. I'm just old. <laughs> okay. Let's talk about augmented reality. Yeah. Uh, and augmented reality encompasses so many things, starting off with gestures. We saw that with uh, Google. Uh, their new phone is going to be gesture controlled. Yeah, so you've got these screen gestures where you can kind of, you know, wave your hand over the screen and it will do something. And you guys were chatting about that. Yeah, we uh, thought it was stupid. And it kind of is. Because Samsung context. had that for one of their phones. What? So you could like skip songs by swiping your hand in front of the screen. Is it ever more efficient? Well, we thought Maybe talking people... to your devices was stupid too. Yeah, but <laughs> that makes more sense, right? So this is, this is actually what I was thinking about is when we start to think about the context of where these gestures would be useful, is Google training us for something that's on the way, right? Are they training us for augmented reality? Because when you think about augmented reality... Or did a bunch of engineers get drunk and say, hey, what if we could control our phone with our hands without touching the phone. Porque no los dos, why not both? Yeah. Um, but th th this is really it, right? Is there is a bit of an engineering challenge here. Now, I've said this for a while, that the next generation of mobile devices, they're, they're not going to be what we see right now. The biggest problem, I think, that a lot of people have with their phones is they are, you know, neck bent down, chin into chest, yep. phone up, in their face, and they're spending a lot of time with this little screen. And what do we see? We see people walking into traffic. We see them almost getting hit by transit doors. We see them fumbling around in the grocery store. It's kind of the worst thing on the planet, right? Amazon has just announced that they've got an Alexa-powered uh, set of glasses. So we've got some voice control there. Apple, however, when they released the iOS 13 Gold Master, there was a readme file in there about how to set up your iPhone for testing your stereoscopic AR apps. Now, what would a stereoscopic AR app be for for a set of glasses with a headset? This is all starting to make sense. Because if you are interacting with an augmented reality display like a headset, are you going to have your phone up in front of you? That's kind of, it's defeating the point. Will you have a ring, an will Amazon you, ring? <laughs> Amazon ring, or will you have a surface like your phone where you don't have to look at it, but you can now navigate by using these gestures? Well, I'm going to be... Uh hitting Toronto this week coming up to get uh, my uh, my North Focal glasses finally fitted. And these are like glasses with a prescription lens that have a heads up display to control it. It comes with a little ring. <laughs> so, you know, am I going to be like the ultimate nerd? Next week, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll talk about how I feel about... Uh, I'll bring in my Google Glass. Yes, yes. <laughs> so I will be the only one sitting here sans glasses. Yes. I'm taking your lunch money, the both of you. Okay, so you're saying that the reason why Google and others are, are doing these gestures uh, is basically to 
train us for the next evolution? I think so. Because here's here's the thing, you know, um, Apple has done this in the past where they've, they've essentially introduced small UI steps along the way, right? We saw it with things like expose. We saw it with the way that they were using smart gestures on their trackpads. Now I salivate when my iPhone rings. <laughs> So they, they, they've trained us across their entire ecosystem to interact with devices in roughly the same way. Pinch Zoom was one of those things, right? Being able to use that on your phone, then taking it back to your Mac and use it for expose. So it's not unheard of for developers to start to seed these control mechanisms beforehand so that we actually feel comfortable. Do you think they're really that smart? You know, I, I'd like to give them some credit. I mean, Google Glass is, is a famous one because when it came out, I looked at it and went, you guys were not thinking, now you were thinking, three or four years from now, and you skipped a step, right? You didn't let us get used to this idea, get used to this product. But that's Google. But that's Google, right? Yeah. And here's the, here's the thing, This is, I think they've learned from their mistakes. So I think looking at these gestures, uh, I think we will see the next generation of Google Glass for consumer. I think, you know, we know now that Apple is working on this stereoscopic AR display, it's coming. Right. And you, you better believe that that leak wasn't accidental. That is very much a get ready for the Apple glasses. And what are we doing? We're talking about it right now. I think this is this is not too far from our future. I, I think Apple glasses are years away if that's even a thing. 100 percent. I, I, I agree with you. But we are we're getting to the point where we're probably going to hear about it relatively soon. Yeah, it'll be interesting. These glasses that I'm getting, uh, again, they're called Focals by a company called North. They kind of look like normal glasses, except they got kind of thicker arms. More Clark Kenty. More Clark Kenty, yes. <laughs> I don't know what kind of crazy radio waves are going to be shooting into my brain, but uh, I'm interested to try them and just to see if I'm going to even use that heads-up display. Well, and I think the ring interaction is a, it's a really interesting way of looking at it, so I'm very curious to see how you feel about it. Yeah, the, the ring at first thought my first thought was that, that seems clunky. But then I also remember the Google Glass, you actually had to swipe your the frame of your glass to interact with it if you couldn't do it all in a voice gesture. So I think Alexa's built into these as well. <laughs> Great. So <laughs> it, it, it's Alexa, kind of, I need more toilet paper. You can apply for Stat, a job with Stat, them. I can apply for a job at McDonald's <laughs> <laughs> through my glasses. <laughs> That's the, pretty cool. If Apple does have this headset coming out, though, they do have a bit of a secret weapon that none of their competitors have right now. What? Which is an interactive uh, mechanism that a lot of Apple users have on them all the time. And that's the Apple Watch, right? You have that rolling dial with the ring. You have the gestures that could happen right on the device. This actually could be your trackpad for your Apple device. Okay, we're going to take a break. When we come back here on the App Show, a few more apps. We're going to do our game app of the week and also John's app pick of the week as well. You're listening to the App Show here on the Chorus Radio Network. Back after this. We're back with the App Show. We've got time for a couple more apps before we uh, get to the game app of the week, John. You've got your John's pick of the week. Right. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Spill it. Spill it. My Talking Pet 2. Okay. Or my Talking Pet Classic. I I tried it. I love it. Explain. (laughs) Explain, John, why it's so delicious. You can basically take pictures or video of your pet, your dog, and animate them with yes. your own voice. So explain how that works. <laughs> I know you're dying here, John. You're going to be known as the talking pet app guy. I, I know. I'll be cursing Christina's name. Yeah. Um, yeah. It, actually, this is this does seem like a lot of fun because I, I talk to my cat all the time. Yeah. And I just wait for her to talk back, but she never does. Yeah. Uh, so now I can actually take a picture of her and animate her responding back to me. Yeah, and so make these crazy little videos for Instagram. And it's pretty easy. You take a picture of your dog or your cat or whatever kind of crazy pet you have, and then you go to a point where you know the eyes are and right. the lips are in the app. It'll walk you through it, and then you can put in audio. Yeah, and it's kind of reminds me like, do you remember on Conan O'Brien when they used to animate a, a photo of some celebrity yeah, like, and they'd have some guy you know mouthing something else? Yeah, it's kind of like that. So, so here's a fun thing. There's actually a Vancouver company that is using this to a, a very impressive degree, uh, it's the Dogmas. The my friend, My friend Ali, so the Dogmas, they, they walk dogs for a living. My friend Ali is a stand-up comedian and yeah. she animates the dogs that they walk <laughs> using this app. If you wanna see some of these examples, it's on Instagram at the Dogmas Vancouver. Dogmas? The Dogmas Vancouver. They're dog moms, the Dogmas. Okay, anyway, if you've got a pet, you gotta try this app out. It is hilarious. I, I give it a thumbs up. Okay, Graham, 
we're going to jump over to you now. You've got the game app of the week. I do, yeah. So I've got I've got two things for you here really quickly. The first game app is Balance the Hat, right? So yep. you uh, this is for iOS. It's free. It's an addicting little game where you try to stay with me here. Balance different objects on top of a car- cartoon character's head. So you have to see how long you can keep this hat on. You have to watch out for bombs, which I think is probably good for all of us in everyday life. And uh, the hats include a top hat, a chicken, a boombox, a cat, a rocking horse, a fishbowl, a soccer ball, a cactus, and many, many more. Okay. And what else you got? Uh, Apple Arcade. Uh, I just wanted to say I've been trying out a bunch of games. Uh, the game that I would recommend that you try out this week is called Outlanders. It's a little like Age of Empires. It's a little like SimCity. Ooh, I like Age of Empires. It's pretty cool. So yeah. it is free with your Apple Arcade subscription. So how much is that again? Five ninety nine. Five ninety nine a month for your entire family. So give that a go. Six bucks for your entire family. Yep. And there's over a hundred games in there. Yep. So when you launch it on your phone or your iPad. Uh, is it just you go into one app or they've got like 100 apps on your phone? So you'll have each individual game app on there. You go into the app, the arcade tab on the app store, you yep. find the games, you download them, it's like you've owned them. Very cool. And if you stop subscribing, they disappear? Poof. That's all the time we have left for the app show. Don't forget to listen to our sister show, Get Connected, here on CKNW and the Course Radio Network. And listen to the podcast versions of them. Uh, they're available at getconnectedmedia.com. Uh, where we also have lots of our great videos uh, as well. This is Mike, Graham, and John logging off for the App Show. We'll see you again next time.